a broadcast service of City College and the San Diego Community College District. This is Jazz FM 88.3 KSDS San Diego. I'm Dave Drexler with Inside Art. Support for Inside Art comes from the members of San Diego's Jazz 88.3. This week on Inside Art, we'll preview some of the 75 musical acts at the Adams Avenue Street Fair, September 23rd and 24th. But first, we welcome a celebrated clarinetist, saxophonist, composer, and arranger acclaimed for his extraordinary versatility and ability to redefine nearly every musical tradition he embraces. Whether it's jazz of any style, Afro-Caribbean, klezmer, funk, hip-hop, classical, or musical theater, Don Byron has relentlessly pursued what he calls a sound above genre. In the late 1990s, Byron served as artistic director of jazz at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, followed by a lengthy residency at New York Symphony Space, plus teaching residencies at Harvard, MIT, UC San Diego, the State University of New York, Albany, and Metropolitan State University in Denver. This Thursday, September 21st, the Don Byron Quartet makes a rare San Diego appearance as part of the Intersections Concert Series at UC San Diego's Park and Market Guggenheim Theater downtown. And Don Byron, it's a great pleasure to have you on Inside Art. Thank you for having me. Well, Don, you come from a musical family, and um, you're a true New Yorker, so you had all these uh, musical influences that uh, you grew up around. Uh, maybe we can start with that musical upbringing and, and all that diversity that surrounded you and uh, made you who you are today. Well, I grew up in, in the Bronx in an era, I guess, when I when when I was first growing up, the Bronx was a very integrated kind of place. And there were lots of people of different ethnic bents. Um, and uh, I heard a lot of clarinet. You know, my m- mom would take me to hear the young people's concerts. And, you know, my dad played in a, in a Calypso outfit that was active most of my under 12 childhood. and. Um, so I, I heard a lot of music and I took music lessons really just as a, a matter of upbringing course. I mean, West Indian kids, you always take music lessons. All, all my cousins took music lessons. And, uh, you know, but I grew up in New York. You know, my dad was friends with people that played in the Ellington and Basie bands. And we, we heard those bands. Um, there was a, lots of Latin music in the Bronx. and. I heard quite a bit of that, and uh, I heard heard a lot of Leonard Bernstein, actually. So all of those things just have, have really combined. Um, you know, most people that come to New York, they're not New Yorkers, you know, we're, they're used to that, that mix. But I really, really grew up there. And I found it interesting that, uh, you know, part of the choice of playing the clarinet initially came from um, suffering from asthma as a kid. Yeah, um, I uh, grew up in an area that was very polluted. Uh, you know, I thought my for years I thought my asthma was really due to this dog that we had that I was allergic to, but it really was <laughs> that um, by the time 1962 came around, um, there were four major roads that um, intersected right around my neighborhood. And I lived in the square between the four roads, the Bruckner Expressway, the Cross Bronx Expressway, the Sheridan Expressway, and the Bronx River Parkway kind of hemmed in my neighborhood. And my neighborhood has the highest rate of asthma in the country. So due to that, I started being medicated. And at a certain point, people either suggested that I swim or play a wind instrument, and that's how I ended up playing the clarinet. So committing to the clarinet uh, and and taking on jazz probably wasn't the easiest choice in the world as you're coming up and and actually, you know, getting educated in the music formally. Well, I I wasn't really interested in in playing any jazz. I was interested in playing clarinet, and those two things are quite different things. Jazz clarinet is this completely white-centric field that's about... Benny Goodman and playing traditional jazz and calling it Dixieland, you know, there were, there are no black people doing that. Mm. There's no, no black people imitating Benny Goodman or any kind of <laughs> stuff like that. There's, 
it just doesn't exist. Even if it does exist, nobody would pay for it. Yeah. People don't really realize how white centric the clarinet is. It is a white centric world. And then jazz clarinet is even more white centric. Interesting. So um, you studied at the New England Conservatory of Music. And is that where you uh, came in contact with George Russell? Was that later on? Yeah, yeah. I studied there with George Russell and this woodwind pedagogue, Joe Allard. And those guys, both of them were, you know, that's really everything that I've done really comes from those two teachers that I had. And in particular, George Russell, uh, because he's uh, really an iconoclastic um presence in jazz at a, of a certain era. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the kind of the specific lessons or things that he taught you. Well, to explain um, George Russell's whole sense of theory, I mean, I, I really consider him more a theorist than a composition teacher. A composition teacher, you, you go to a composition lesson and they go, you know, I want you to write something in sonata form and it has to have this and that, and then you do that. Um, he was more a theorist, but he, he was a very important theorist because he really defined what major means in a very specific way. Um, most people define the major, their sense of major comes from what we call the major scale, but the major scale has some flaws in it. And so he defined major by the Lydian scale, which has... Um, a slightly raised sixth step, a uh, fourth step. But it's the major that when you hear the end of a Henry Mancini song and there's this beautiful but odd sounding major, you know, Mancini was a big Lydian major guy. Stravinsky, all of, all of his major is Lydian. Um, so it, it was his definition of major is what we've come to. When people think of major, they think of the major seventh and sharp four, flat five, those kinds of things. But but he was one of the first real theoretical proponents that that was really what major was about. As you've gone forward in your career, I, there's a certain um, thread of uh, study that you, you really, uh, you know, deep diving that you get into with all of the the styles of music that you uh, go about pursuing, um, a very detailed sort of study. Um, does that come from a, a certain discipline you developed early on, or did you develop that later? Well, a lot of the things that I've done, uh, I can kind of attribute to the department that I was in, the third stream department, of, which was run by Rand Blake. Um, the... Um, whole experimental nature of the thing really included world music, free music, different kinds of, uh, you know, Bram was very interested in, in kind of modern gospel music. Um, he was very interested in film noir and film scoring and a, a lot of those things that I've been associated with um, you could have done in the third stream, even if I didn't do them in the third stream. Um, it was a very curriculum that wasn't so much about written music, but, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on ear training and being able to get information from recordings and from listening. So a lot, while I was at in the third stream, there was Greek music, there was Indian music, there was gamelan, there was Jewish music, there was all of these different things and I've really just you know while I was there I just developed the ability to be a world musician you know like one of the things that I really didn't like about my career was that nobody just people thought that if I was playing that pleasure music it was because it was jazz but really I'm a world musician and studying world music is a little different than studying jazz or studying classical music there, there's some crossover but to study somebody who's playing in in a, some kind of non-jazz non-classical ethnic thing it takes a certain kind of discipline and uh, I think 
I, I was already kind of doing some of those things with Latin music and different things that I was interested in before I got to New England. But I think I just really found a, a place at New England where people were kind of going about things that way. Now, it, it sort of sounds you know, stiff and academic in some ways, but your music is really characterized by a lot of fun. Yeah, I, you know, I I just tend to, um, I'm not I'm not a, a staid kind of person. I mean, particularly, um, I think what I brought to some of the ethnic things I've done is a certain kind of, um, just kind of weirdness, nastiness, craziness, <laughs> um, you know, which a lot, you know, if you study those musics and you study the the greats in those different kinds of music, they have that too. But people don't really think of it that way. But I think people people see it more in me because they know that I'm not of this particular ethnic bent. Well, uh, one of those artists that's influenced you a lot in the jazz specter is uh, Joe Henderson, and maybe you can uh, kind of share the the admiration or um, your feelings about Joe Henderson as a player. Yeah, well, um, you know, when I was first studying with George, was around the same time I discovered Joe Henderson. I think it, one of, one of my uncles had a recording of Lee Morgan's that I borrowed permanently from him called Delightful Lee. And uh, I just had never really heard anything like that. I mean, my connection to, you know, who I was listening to at the time was really Train and Eric Dolphy and a couple other things, but Train and Eric Dolphy, those were like the things for me. Like, But I, I didn't really feel super defined by them i just found them exciting but uh, i think that a lot of what i talked about with george russell and defining the various chord qualities in certain kinds of ways and then changing that and modifying that that's that's really the way that joe henderson played and i remember i was with george and i said well what do you think of of Joe Henderson, and he immediately whipped out um, one of his later recordings called Living Time, which is all just Joe Henderson playing over all this crazy stuff that he wrote. So he seemed to have the same admiration for Joe Henderson that I did. And uh, when I discovered him, he wasn't exactly on the tip of everybody's tongue. You know, he wasn't, it was before any of the quote unquote comebacks that he made. I think he was living out in the Bay area, but uh, I didn't, I didn't get to go out there and study with him, but I just began a long process of studying his playing and, and loving him and getting to hear him. And I remember uh, when, when I was, I was on this Verve tour with the uh, Kansas city band and there were, Two other bands, a Charlie Hayden band and a Joe Anderson band. I would just be always off the side of the stage, just checking him out, just try to soak in his whatever. We're talking with Don Byron, who will be performing at UCSD's Park and Market on Thursday, September 21st. Uh, Don, maybe you can um, kind of preview the, the concert a little bit with your quartet you're bringing in. Yeah, well... You know, mostly I do, over the years, most of the music that I've written um, is for various films and also the occasional commission. And so we'll be playing some of that and some of the other music that I'm interested in. Um, I don't know. I'm really uh, interested in a lot of different things lately. Woody Shaw is kind of an interest of mine lately. Um, all kinds of different things that we'll be playing. And maybe you can uh, go over the band that's going to be with you. Uh, Mark Elias on bass, my friend Joe Berkowitz on, on piano, and Drew Heller, who's an amazing drummer that I met in Denver when I was teaching there. 
And uh, this will be on Thursday, the 21st at UC San Diego's Park and Market. Um, I understand you also did a podcast most recently. Um, is that available? We haven't put it out yet, but we did um, four podcast episodes while I was in residency at MIT. And uh, they're all quite super interesting. One with uh, one of my heroes, the trumpet player and, and composer arranger, Luis Perico Ortiz, who was absolutely one of my absolute heroes of all time. Um, one with Stanley Drucker, who was at the time 90 years old and had just retired from the, the, the New York Philharmonic on clarinet at 90. Um, we did uh, an interview with Gary Bartz and an interview with three or four other black clarinet players, which is kind of personal, but very interesting. So we're working on putting those out somewhere in the next few months. And that'll be The Gory Details. Is that the name of the it? The Gory Details. Yeah. <laughs> Hosted by Don Byron, my guest on this week's segment of Inside Art. It'll be great to have you in San Diego on the 21st. Don, thanks for joining us again on Inside Art. All right. Thank you. The Don Byron Quartet performs as part of the Intersections Concert Series Thursday, September 21st at 7 p.m. at UC San Diego's Park and Market venue in downtown San Diego. You can purchase tickets and learn more at parkandmarket.ucsd.edu. Coming up, we'll preview the 41st Annual Adams Avenue Street Fair and some of its 75 musical acts. That's next as Inside Art continues here on San Diego's Jazz 88.3. Funding for Inside Art comes from the members of Jazz 88.3, where your support brings the joy and history of jazz and all of the arts to San Diego. To become a member, visit jazz88.org forward slash donate.